I'm here with Coach Joe Ehrman uh, on episode number 46 of the Path to Follow podcast. Coach Ehrman, thanks so much for uh, for joining me on Zoom today. Jake, a pleasure to be with you and uh, and with back in the Gilman community. Absolutely, yeah. I've heard so much about you, and I'm I'm really excited to talk about your time at Gilman and your influence as a coach and a mentor and a leader for so many Gilman boys, but but so many you know men in general. And um, and I was reading Inside Out Initiative and Inside Out Coaching, your your book, uh, before I came on today, and and you talked a lot about. Uh, Roy Simmons as um, a coach who had such a huge impact on you. And as a lacrosse player myself, I've, I've heard so much about him. Um, but I was thinking maybe we could start t- and talk about Roy Simmons' impact on you as a transformational coach um, and some of those coaching um, characteristics that you admired so much about Roy Simmons. Yeah. Well, let me just give you the context. So I went to uh... – Syracuse University. I was a, on a football scholarship, and uh, I blew my knee out uh, one spring football. And, and rehabbing uh, uh, that fall, I ended up picking up a stick for the first time, and uh, ended up playing that season. And uh, Roy Simmons was in his, I think, his second year, just beginning to build that culture up there, but. Uh, I had, uh, you know, I grew up in an era where just about all my coaches were World War II veterans. And there was this real mentality about breaking, you know, boys down in order to build men and you got to earn or prove or validate your masculinity. And I had a lot of those coaches. And Coach Simmons was the first uh, coach that I remember. He gave me a totally different uh, model for masculinity. Uh, he was an athlete, but he was uh, primarily an artist. And I think that's what he brought into uh, lacrosse that made him so exceptional. He brought in not only uh, the artistry of that sport and the mastery of it, but also the spirituality, uh, the very groundedness and the sacredness, the transformative power that uh, that sport has held historically in uh, Native communities. So, um uh, yeah, he was the first guy that uh, didn't scream, didn't yell. You could relate. He was kind of a hippie at that time. Uh, uh, just really uh, touched me in many ways. And it took me a long time to figure out uh, why he made such an impact on me in such a short period of time. Because mm-hmm. I only played for for one season, but you know, I, I kept in contact with them. But uh, I, I think to boil it down, I was just a boy that was always on this quest to figure out what it meant to be a man. Mm-hmm. And I didn't have men in my life to uh, really model and teach that and nurture me in that. So I was always looking at other men, trying to figure out how a man acts, how a man carries himself. And um, the world of football, the world that I had lived in had been uh, very narrow. Uh, on, on the old traditional bounds of masculinity. And he was the first uh, coach that I had that modeled that in a different way. And I was thirsty for that, hungry for that. Did you have um, coaches after uh, Coach Simmons who, who similarly impacted you? Or was he really the model for you as you started to become a coach that you, you mostly looked towards him as – kind of the epitome of a transformational coach. Are there other coaches that you had who had maybe different ways of going about um, that that role as a transformational coach, or was he really the one that you looked to mostly? Yeah, I, I think in um, I think he certainly was foundational, uh, a seminal model for me. But uh, I think what I brought was, I think you always take a collection of bits and pieces from everybody that uh, is your coach or is a teacher, somebody that has a mentor power in your life. So I think I learned a lot from the bad coaches, what I call transactional coaches. I learned a great deal uh, from transformational coaches as well. So uh, I I think the number one principle of coaching is that to be a better coach, you've got to be a better you, Uh, that you always uh, have this responsibility coach, teacher, whoever, to bring the best version of yourself 
And that is a lifelong quest and a lifelong challenge for all of us to continue to grow. We have to grow beyond our, our own uh, cultural moral ways. We got to develop our thinking, but all of us have to have this responsibility uh, uh, to grow. So to grow, you've got to really process you know, that old saying in the absence of reflection, history, coaching, relationships, marriages tend to repeat themselves. Mm -hmm. So if you have this quest to be the best version of yourself, then, uh, yeah. So anyhow, that's the principle that I teach to be a better coach. You've got to be a better you. Yeah. I love that. And, and one of the things that I, I loved from, um, from, from reading a little bit about your relationship with coach Simmons is his acronym dig dignity, integrity, and grace. And those are, those are almost three words that you don't really hear, um, talked about much, I think in, in sports, especially dignity and grace, especially, I mean, integrity at Gilman is something that is stressed in the Gilman five, but, um, I, I really liked the anecdote, uh, about, about dig and lacrosse. And then the other one that maybe we can talk more about is how, uh, you, you talked about a story, how Syracuse was down at halftime and, and in the locker room, the only thing Coach Simmons wrote up on the on the board was one eighteen twenty four, uh, Psalm one eighteen verse twenty four. This is the day the Lord has made, so rejoice and be glad in it. And I think uh, th those two um, parts of your book really struck me as you know they're, they're not maybe typical examples of of what a coach does, especially in my experience playing college lacrosse and and playing lacrosse all my life. Those are very um, different ways of coaching, but but maybe we can talk about how those impacted you, the, the Psalm 118.24, and then dig, uh, uh, Coach Simmons stressing dignity, integrity, and grace. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think the best way to say this is, uh, you know, there's, there's two types of character. So there's performance character, and that governs our relationship with ourself. So things like grit and self-determination, overcoming obstacles, perseverance, those are basically built into American sports, and I would say into American masculinity as well. Uh, those things, performance, uh, uh, character is what kind of defines uh, many men, too many men. Uh, so you have that. Then the second thing is moral character. Moral character has to do with the things that govern our relationships with others, trust, respect, kindness, empathy, moral courage. Um, those need to become primary in athletics, particularly interscholastic athletics, uh, intercollegiate athletics. Uh, we have that kind of power. So, uh, you know, when Coach Simmons could talk about dignity and, and grace, uh, he understood that his sense of self who he was as a man and as a coach wasn't dependent on the performance of his team. Uh, he had this, you know, really a calling. Um, and he understood that you could, you could win with humility and you could lose with grace. Mm -hmm. uh, just wasn't a life and death battle. So uh, it's something that needs to uh, ha occur more. And then all of us uh, have this responsibility. And I, I, when you talk about high school sports, college sports, there's a large longitudinal study over 15 years now that basically shows that the longer you play athletics, the higher levels that you attain, the more morally and ethically callous you become. There's something leukemic uh, in American sports, particularly youth and high school sports, for the healthy moral development. Uh, it's become this one at all cost, this ego uh, uh, satisfaction or drive uh, at the sp expense of the moral development. And I think what Coach Simmons always, I think all great transformational coaches transformative people uh, historically have always understand that a team, uh, a community is, is a set of relationships for a cause, uh, that the more you're related to each other, the more intimate, the more authentic your community is, uh, the more committed you are to an agreed upon cause, uh, the greater your performance is going to be. So 
you know, we, we have to, and, and, and Coach Simmons is this part out of his respect for Native American uh, tradition and spirituality, others out of his artistic uh, wholeness of who he was as a, as a man in this culture, uh, intentionally taught um, and modeled a moral character. So the reality is that when you talk about all our social emotional intelligence and character development, all that stuff is learned. And if it's learned, it can be taught, but it can't be learned if it's not modeled. Mm -hmm. You don't develop empathy until someone's empathic with you. You don't um, learn respect until someone respects you. Uh, so anyway, I, I think that's what really uh, separated him uh, and he brought his spirituality, which is not religion. It's a quest for self-transcendence. Mm -hmm. And that's really part of the basis of, of the spirituality of lacrosse. You, you transcend self for your team or for your village or for your tribe. Uh, it wasn't about individual glory. I'm not using the other nine guys to bolster my career, my visibility. Uh, we're kind of in this together. And that, I think, every team that uh, I've ever played for a coach has been great has always been dependent on the authenticity of the relationship built mm -hmm. peer to peer, player to player, coach player. And then how commitment was uh, the cause, common purpose, performance goals and objective, but always built on a mutual um, sense of trust, respect, integrity of each team member. So when, when you were putting all of this together as the head football coach at, at Gilman, uh, is there a specific maybe anecdote or example of, of a time that you really that you really felt and remember um, teaching moral courage on the football team? You talk about mor moral courage, and obviously you have to have so much courage physically to play the sport of football. But but as a coach at Gilman, do you remember uh, one moment that really encapsulates how you taught moral courage or empathy on the football field here? Yeah. Uh, well, let me say this. I was, I was not the head coach. Biff Pogey was the head coach. I was his assistant. And, um, and he had come to me to ask if I wanted to coach with him. And uh, I said, on the condition that we just blow this up, I had no desire to do a traditional coaching thing. But on the concept of moral courage, uh, you know, we did teachings all the time. So, you know, one of the outcomes of unhealthy masculinity is uh, male violence toward women. So when you look at the statistics and numbers of women that are being perpetrated by men, mm -hmm. uh, men, are, men are the solution and part of the cause, but uh, so sexual abuse, uh, dating abuse, uh, domestic violence, those kinds of issues, um, they come out of this unhealthy masculinity. Uh, but the antidote to them is for all of us, and this happens in every community, every society, uh, we have to have the moral courage to speak out on behalf of the girls, the women, uh, our mothers and our wives. And we have all these students and student athletes that can display this tremendous physical courage. Want to play when it, it, they're hurt, put me back in the game, coach. Uh, but they can't stand up to peer pressure. Mm -hmm. They don't have the moral courage to say this is wrong. It's just not right. So I think uh, your team has to be built on this. Part of what being a teammate is, you know, we need each other. We affect each other. We depend on each other. Uh, we call each other out on the midst of this. So it was just uh, we would do gender violence, dating abuse teaching and talk about moral courage because uh, not enough just to be a good man. You have to be an involved man. You can't turn your eye. You can't wink at it. You can't ignore it. You have a moral responsibility to stand up. And it's courageous because you're going to risk being rejected, uh, possibly ridiculed. Uh, but you have the opportunity to start becoming a man of, of substance and purpose. Yeah. And and most of the time, that's that's way harder than physical courage. Anything you do with your body is actually standing up for something and not turning your eye and you know, confronting things that are psychologically much more difficult than anything you do with your physical body on the football field. Absolutely. 
And it's, it's built again on these false concepts of masculinity that men deny pain, men don't go to the doctors that much, men repress or restrict a lot of their emotions. So it takes a pretty healthy man to uh, uh, be able to uh, display moral courage and a real sense of self. So let me ask you about those um, those myths of masculinity, right? You have the, the three myths that, you, that you've talked about over the course of your career. What are those myths and where do you think they come from, right? The, the myth of um, being a man and what that entails. And, and I teach English here at Gilman, and that's actually one of the things that I talk about through literature is, you know, we're reading Death of a Salesman today, and, and it's a similar conversation about, you know, this character thinks that to be a man, you have to act in this way and to be successful, you have to, you know, do this and, and obtain this. And those common misconceptions are really important to kind of look closely at and, and break down. Yeah, that's a great question. Deep question, Jake. Um, you know, part of it is just our gender socialization in this country and every other country. You know, the big thing today is reveal parties where a pregnant couple has a friend and they reveal the gender of it. And there's usually some kind of uh, juxtaposed positions of masculinity and femininity. Visits. Footballs or tutus, you know. And so from the moment that child is born, uh, it is socialized to a prescribed set of traits that it's learning that it needs to manifest to, uh, you know, be accepted in the house community. Um, so on. So, um, yeah, we just start raising boys and girls very different at a very early age. And every boy in this socialization process is given this social mandate, usually when they're three, four, five years old. And that is uh, when they're told to be a man, uh, be a man. It's almost always in the context of stop with the tears, stop with the emotion, don't be a mama's boy, some kind of sissy, suck it up, be a man. And those three words trigger all kinds of, uh, of issues and uh, issues and problems uh, in this country. So then as a boy starts moving out of his home, uh, then you're, you're socialized by our culture, just the media messaging the boys. Uh, so every boy is given three fundamental lies about what it means to be a man. And the first one is, uh, as a culture, we associate masculinity with issues of athletic ability, as though you can measure what it means to be a man based on a job type, uh, based on uh, size, strength, um, capacity to compete and win on that playground. So, you know, some of the boys on the Gilman playground today, some of them have athletic ability. Uh, they enjoy athletics. Uh, they can hit the down and out or catch the down and out and hit the hanging curve. Uh, those boys tend to be elevated on playgrounds across this country. Uh, the other boys that have less interest, have other interests, other passions in life, uh, those boys at a very early age get labeled as non-athletes. And you start this athlete, non-athlete, boy, real boy kind of uh, uh, mentality. So they're pushed against the peripheral of the playground. And they're impregnated with this idea at a very early age that they don't have quite have what it takes to be a man based on the first line. Um, the boys that are elevated, uh, they're set up for a tremendous sense of failure because being a man certainly has nothing to do with athletic ability. Second lie, you start learning junior high, high school in this culture, and that is that we associate masculinity with issues of sexual conquest. Somehow you can uh, measure uh, virility or masculinity based on the women that you're associating with uh, a certain look. And uh, those are men uh, that need some kind of validation through uh, women uh, in order to find some kind of sense of uh, their own manhood and masculinity. Uh, that leads to tremendous problems and it really creates a, a huge issue um, uh, you know, on this whole gender issue. And then the third thing is economic success. And that is the culture uh, uh, we teach, you know, young boys, we teach men that uh, it's really, uh, it's the possessions what matters, mm -hmm. uh, not who you are. It's economic success above all. 
uh, those three lives every boy in America gets, uh, they get in their families, uh, they get in the schools, the communities, and this culture 24-7. Um, so that's what, that's kind of what we're up against. And, um, and if masculinity is about relationships, commitment to a cause, and there's probably a, not a better place, uh, might be as good a place, but not a better place than uh, through team athletics. And, and why do you think that is? Because, and, and I had Coach Guline on here a couple of weeks ago too, and we I asked him a similar question, or he brought up a similar question: is why is it that sports are the best place to um, to to grow a healthy uh, masculinity type? And you could do it in so many different ways, but at schools like Gilman, we take sports so seriously and we have the teacher coach model and we, we, we want, we want kids to play sports. Like why is a school like Gilman and why are um, institutions like Gilman focused on sports as, as the place to bring out these positive masculine qualities that we, we aspire men to become, uh, you know, like in a positive way. Yeah. Uh, well, my experience at Gilman was they certainly did that from multiple perspectives, not just athletics. I think it was Socrates that said the two most important venues to create a just society were the gymnasium and the symphony hall. It was always about this mutuality of effort on behalf of something bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, so I think, you know, you could do this and, you know, what I'm talking about in football or sports, you could do it in band class. it's all about relationships that's what the whole power of this thing is. all these activities do is give you the context uh, as a as an adult to look young people in the eye and just affirm their value their dignity their human worth as an adult be able to say i see in you you're on this kind of path you have this kind of stuff uh that's that that's that's the power that's the transformative power mm -hmm. uh, all of us are on this hero's journey and all, in all these passages of life, we continue to find these adversities and challenges. And it seems at near the moment of defeat, along comes the, the wise mentor, the mentor coach to help you get through the times of adversities. And so I think, uh, I think it can take place in the classroom. I think it can take uh, place many places, but I think it's, I think it's where you have the most amount of time to do that, certainly on an educational setting. For sure. Uh, yeah. Um, so uh, a couple other thoughts and, and questions. I know we don't don't have too much more time left, but I, I, I want to know maybe uh, for you, what was the, maybe the most memorable moment of your Gilman experience? I know there are probably so many, but thinking about your time coaching football here, is there is there something that sticks out to you as especially memorable for you? Well, I loved my whole time uh, at Gilman, both as a parent. I uh, had two sons that uh, were 12-year men there, and then uh, all the years of coaching football. And really, when I look back over my life, and I've been involved in ministry and a number of causes for a lifetime, uh, I think I might be most proud at the time at Gilman, uh, what we created and did there. And uh, that really is something I think the Gilman community should be proud of. Uh, what we brought in uh, was this purpose-based football coaching that the whole purpose of why, why do we even have uh, sports and athletics in high school? Mm -hmm. you know, in Europe, they're all clubs that take place outside of school. And I think what we've done in America is we've lost sight of what the purpose is of athletics. What is it supposed to serve? Uh, athletics is never a, 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 an end up into itself. It's always a means to some kind of uh, end. And I think, uh, I think uh, you know, we stood on the shoulders of Reddy uh, Finney, a longtime headmaster at Kilney, who had uh, transformed Biff life by affirming him, value him. So uh, Biff had a philosophy based on his experience with Reddy, and I had my own uh, thoughts, and we came together and uh, created something that's really significant. And I, again, I, I think Gilman should be proud of uh, what it's done in athletics. And I'm sure it has continued to uh, do so. But, uh, you know, now Biff is at St. Francis. 
uh, taking that philosophy and how do you use football to help boys become men to build a more fair, just society. I'm running a, a national initiative uh, all over the country and have created somewhat of a movement uh, that all was birthed out of Gilman. Mm -hmm. I have uh, I have seven, eight, maybe nine uh, board members uh, on my board of directors for the Insider Initiative are all Gilman grads. They're all uh, young men that I had coached uh, 20 years ago. Uh, they're men that have experienced the very best that Gilman has to offer. Uh, they've all... Um, utilize athletics to uh, improve their education, to improve their capacity uh, and responsibilities to build a better world. So I'd be hard pressed to put it in a moment. Uh, I have so many moments, but um, I, I'm just really proud of that, uh, that time. I'm, uh, I'm proud of Gilman for allowing us to do that. And um, yeah, well, wonderful. It was a great time. I'm thrilled my uh, two sons had the opportunity to be part of Gilman. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Um, it's a great place. And, and that's one of the things that before I came in to, to teach and coach here, I read Season of Life and, and I knew that I was going to be involved in, you know, the type of place that that allowed that to happen and built something important and transformational and uh, that really excited me and inspired me to to coach and, and teach here. So um, thank you for that. So coach, um, maybe maybe one or two more questions if yeah, that if that's all right. Done. Yeah. Okay. Um, so character on a team and building culture and building a football program, what are some ways that you you inspire coaches to measure the character of a team or the culture of a team, right? Those are such vague terms, but how do you make those tangible and, and um, really measure the type of culture that coaches are building for their players? Yeah, well, I would say, and uh, what I teach is that culture lives at the intersection of your purpose, your goals, your definition of success and your moral values. So, uh, my coaching purpose was I coach to help boys become men of empathy and integrity who would leave, uh, lead, be responsible and change the world for good. Uh, I understood my goals were the things that were going to help me get to achieve what my purpose was. My highest values, moral values were always empathy and integrity. I wanted to make sure my heart was always open to my players' feelings, their own life and educational circumstances. Uh, I wanted to understand what they felt and because uh, it wasn't all that dissimilar from what I felt when I was 15, 16, 17. And then I also wanted to have integrity. Integrity had to do with the uh, alignment between what you say, what you think, and what you do. Um, so right at that intersection is you create your culture. Uh, which determines, you know, you got to have common language. It determines what behavior is accepted, not accepted, those kind of things. So to me, a culture of, be of belonging is a critical thing that's needed in, um, in athletics. Uh, boys are taught from a very early age, they have to fit in. We suppress all kinds of emotions, all kinds of attributes, all kinds of part of our true essence in order to fit in. Uh, we get this boy code at a very early age. Uh, we know not to cry in front of other boys, not to share, not to feel, not to seem weak or feminine or gay in front of other boys. So we start suppressing to that boy code. And then we learn that at a very early age too, we learn that if we step outside of those rules, we're going to get hurt. We're going to get ostracized. We're going to get bullied. We're going to get labeled. We're going to get name called. And so you grow up as a young boy uh, with this tremendous pressure and the pressure of society is to separate the heart from the head, uh, trying to believe that masculinity can be lived from the neck up. Uh, that is a, you know, challenge boys to maintain the connection between the heart and the, uh, and, and the head. And do you I forgot where I was going with that. It, it well, that just brings me to to a thought that I had. Do you think that's um, do you think that's declining? Do you think that's kind of a 
almost in the past in some ways, that type of stereotype for men? Or do you still see that as present in our culture and our society today that, you know, men shouldn't cry and men should be tough in certain ways and, you know, men should those three myths, basically, do you still see that as an issue that, that needs fixing in, in society today? Or do you think that's on the decline in some ways? Well, I think as a, generally speaking, I think men are doing a much better job, a much better job uh, as husbands, as, you know, as, as fathers, co-parenting. Uh, but we've got a long way to go. Boy, when you look at the statistics, you know, of men that don't know how to develop relationships that are living in isolation uh, don't know how to enter in community uh, are just hidden behind these walls the amount of substance abuse medication trying to medicate this pain of not feeling man enough not feeling woman enough so drugs alcohol sex pornography whatever you need to attach to to feel more secure about you and then uh, you know this third thing is violence uh, this unhealthy masculinity with all of its restricted uh, uh, language and emotions. Uh, we've got all these men walking around with this low-grade uh, fever of anger and resentment, and it just spikes periodically. So, you know, when you think about violence in America, I mean, it, it's shocking, the numbers. Uh, and that's interpersonal violence. When you start talking about um, you know, verbal violence, sexual violence, abusive kind of violence. You start thinking about uh, self-inflicted violence. We've got so many young people today and young adults uh, have all this pressure on them and they take that inward and turn that inward on themselves. But when you look at the suicide rates of, uh, of young boys that's taking place in this country, uh, we've got a long, long way to go. And these are deep systemic uh, issues and you know masculinity is really not even a term uh, the real term is masculinities because there is no masculinity it's a cultural construct and it's shaped from community and culture and family in many uh, uh, nuanced kinds of ways but um, it goes back to all of this uh, moral character it goes back to why we've got to connect and Again, the beauty of Gilman uh, being a, a single unit from K to 12, you just want to walk boys through this journey of masculinity. Again, that hero's journey mm -hmm. and uh, make sure that they're connected to transformational people that are going to validate them, that have earned their respect and integrity. Uh, when you could unify, unify that for 12 straight years, same kind of coaching, same kind of teaching, same kind of value, different subjects, uh, you know, age-wise, but um, now you got a real fighting chance. And uh, why I say it's team, uh, team sports is such a great place because it's easier to change a group of boys than one individual isolated boy. You can create these cultures that uh, flourish and are, and are nurtured by uh, moral character, not the performance kind of stuff. So, uh, yeah, I think America's doing better, but it's got a long, long way to go. In a place um, like Gilman, those relationships and that network and that uh, pr that process is so, like, guided, right? We, we hire teachers and coaches here for that purpose, to form relationships and to build better men for the future. But in places that don't have a system like this, that don't have – the types of coaches that we're talking about, transformational coaches, they don't really connect as well. They're lacking relationships. What are some other counters to the, the myths that we're, that guys can fall into or the violence or the drugs or some of those other vices that boys can fall into if they don't have the same type of support that we, we, you know, we see at Gilman and in other places, but aren't really provided in, different areas of the United States. Yeah, and you think of all the resources and knowledge and commitment Gilman has made uh, to helping boys uh, on this journey toward healthy masculinity and still the challenges boys face in Gilman and every other school in this culture. But I think every boy needs two fundamental things. Every boy needs one uh, man, whether that's a father, whether that's a mentor, a coach or a teacher that's farther down the road and can just look back on that boy
boy and tell them you're on the right path. You've got the right stuff. Mm -hmm. You've got what it takes to be a man. You got all the emotions. You're developing all of these performance and character skills. But every every boy needs that. And I think when a boy does not have that, boy, that's that's a real challenge. And I think the second thing that every boy needs is a some kind of brother, some kind of classmate, some kind of teammate that you can walk through life uh, together, openly and honestly sharing all of the emotions and constricted stuff. And I think boys, uh, again, we're just so constricted with boys. Mm -hmm. um, and, and sports is a big perpetrator of that. It's part of the solution, but it also could be part of the answer. Yeah, I think we're constricted in, in a lot of ways. And that's, again, some of the conversations that come up in my English class that I teach is it's not only with the definition of what it means to be a man, but it's also things like, what does it mean to be successful? What does it mean to be um, a good teammate, right? Some of those other questions, I think we have such simple straw man solutions or ideas that I don't know where they come from, but um, they come from a place that lacks experience and mentorship and guidance. And uh, I think that's what, what you've done and you've been trying to do for so long is is break those down so um uh, it's really important yeah i think it's just critical that every uh every person and particularly every uh you know young man uh understands their own life narrative uh you've got to make sense out of your life uh the family you were born into the experiences that you had and uh, all of us need to develop this uh life narrative you know, that's the key to developing relationship but all of us have been enculturated we all can remember these moments when we first uh, were ashamed of our tears showing our emotions when we got ostracized we all have these memories and stuff and when you bring boys together and collectively give them permission to talk about their common humanity and boys or the pressure they've been under for all this time with the boy code the man box Coaches are in the same box of not wanting to look too weak, be in control, know your stuff. Um, yeah, there's just incredible opportunities. And, and I think it's a lifelong quest. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think the work is just beginning and uh, it crosses every socioeconomic uh, strata in this country. And you know, a lot of that is just driven by the father wound, which is a huge issue uh, in this country. And the father wound is any ongoing relational, social, emotional injury or deficit uh, that rose out of an unhealthy relationship with a father. Now, that might be a father you never knew. It might be a father that died or uh, was distant or, you know, uh, geographically challenged or something. But um, uh, that wounding uh, is what creates so many problems. And I've been in and around the NFL for 50 years now. Um, do a lot of work with teams. And I would say the number one common denominator of professional football players is father-son dysfunction. It's having that to, to always prove yourself, always try to get appreciation and validation from someone that probably didn't have it to give to you. And it creates this pathological drive for success. I think it's not only true in the football locker room, I think it's true in the boardroom as well. It creates this pathological drive that I'm gonna be so successful, I'm gonna to prove to him. And it's pathological because you end up saying, I don't care what the cost is to my wife, my kids, or to myself, I'm gonna prove this. So that, you know, uh, coaches, and particularly in a boys' school like Gilman, uh, you know, coaches have this, tremendous opportunity and responsibility but again uh, masculinity is learned therefore it can be taught but it can't be taught if it's not modeled mm -hmm. so you know both as men and women uh, we need to have our right concepts and definitions about what it means to be a man how we're going to help boys onto their own unique manifestation of their own masculinity Awesome. Well, uh, Coach Ehrman, thanks so much for, for speaking with me today. And it's great to meet you, even though it's on Zoom. Um, but I really appreciate everything you've done for Gilman and, and for boys and, uh, and look forward to seeing you again and, and keeping in touch. Well, great to meet you, Jake, and go Greyhounds.
Go ahead. Yeah, love my time there. I always consider myself part of that community. Awesome. Thanks, Coach. Appreciate it. All right. Peace. Peace.